Wow. Thanks very much indeed um, for the invitation to this terrific event here. I'm, I'm truly honored to be the first speaker in this, uh, in this series altogether, and I'm especially honored that so many people have come here this evening. Um, you do know this is a talk about infrastructure. Yeah, you do know. Okay, that's fine. That's great. Um, I've been researching infrastructure for about 20, 25 years, and I've never seen an attendance like this at an infrastructure, which is why I'm asking. Yeah. Um, I'm obviously going to have to leave out my dance routine as well because I haven't got the space to do it, but never mind. Um, when, I, when I was coming here this morning to come here from, from Berlin, um, I used multiple infrastructures without giving them a second thought. I got up in the morning, I put the kettle on to make my tea using electricity, put the tap on, wash my hands, checked the smartphone to see if I got any messages, then went down into the street, stood at the green man at the traffic light, this is Germany, yeah, and then got on the S-Bahn and came over here. So I was using lots of different technical infrastructures without a thought. We just take these things for granted, yeah? until they don't work, yeah? And when the lights go out and your freezer goes off or you have a blocked toilet, then you do notice them, but otherwise we don't really notice them. So this series, I mean, this series is about the relationship between infrastructures and cities, how they depend on each other, how they co-evolve, how they need shaping, how they need changing for the new demands of today. And in my first lecture in this series, I want to give you an introduction, an overview of the importance of infrastructure, or about this relationship between cities and infrastructures. I want to show how and why infrastructures are important to modern urban life. And I'm going to do that, perhaps rather curiously, by looking at history, and the history of the city that I know and love, I know very well, Berlin. And you may think that's a bit odd, because Berlin has a very, very peculiar, turbulent history. So why, how can you learn from a, hist from a city like that? But I'm going to argue that Berlin shows in sharp relief lots of dimensions to the relationship between a city and its infrastructure, otherwise it gets hidden in other cities that we don't really see. So Berlin, I'm saying, is not a representative case, but it's a very, very insightful case about the politics of urban infrastructure. Okay, how am I going to structure my talk? Well, I'm going to start off with um, a sort of rather light-hearted introduction about uh, why we disregard infrastructures and yet what we expect from them. And then I'm going to go a little deeper into the kind of why infrastructures have really taken off in the social sciences in particular, history of technology and urban studies, or why so many scholars are getting so excited about infrastructures. And then I'm going to come to the kind of meat of my talk, to the bit about Berlin. And I'm going to sort of, it's, it's, it's work that it comes from a book that I've just finished writing, a little bit of advertising, um, which is about Berlin, the political history of Berlin's infrastructure in the last century. And so I'm very mindful of telling a story that goes all the way across those hundred years up to the present day. So I'll be picking on some cross-cutting themes, look at that history, that kind of illustrate some generic challenges for infrastructures today. Okay, so that's what I have in mind. I'm going to talk first a little bit about myopias of infrastructure. Why do we disregard infrastructure? Yeah, although they're there, they're omnipresent all the time, but we just don't think about them very much. Well, the first answer is, is pretty easy. It's, it's the invisibility of these infrastructures. Although we're, they're there, they're omnipresent, we just don't see them. So we walk over a manhole cover, and we just don't think of the sewers down below and the people who keep those sewers clear and the scientists who've worked out the dimensions of the sewers and the technologies connected to them and the money involved. We just don't think about those kind of things. It's really like out of sight, out of mind, dead easy. The second reason is because of the technical complexity. This is a, a natural gas distribution hub in Berlin. And when I went in there, I had a single guide taking me around. I don't know, it doesn't show, you can't see the size of it there, but I was just overawed by the technology and the hissing pipes and all the rest. And I was even more overawed by my guide, who I soon began to lose track of what he was talking about. And so this is another issue, the technical complexity, the idea that this is a realm of expertise that you or I cannot really grapple with. That's another reason why we kind of push infrastructure into the background. This is a realm for experts, we like to think. 
And the third reason is to do with the obduracy. Infrastructures have a, an aura of durability, of obduracy. We think they resist change. So why do we look at infrastructures if we were looking at urban transitions? Why start there? You see some, there's some maps of the water supply system in Berlin. Uh, you can't see it in great detail, but basically it's showing that the water mains has not really changed from 1929 to the present day. So if you could beam some infrastructure planners from the 1920s in the present day, they would be astounded to recognize most of the structures of the sewers and the water systems. So the appearance is of durability and resistance to change, and that's another reason, a third reason, why we just take these things for granted. Now, the paradox is, the paradox is that while we have this blinkered view, this myopic view on infrastructures, we nevertheless expect wonders from them. All sorts of tasks they're meant to be performing today, um, which are very broad indeed. And I'm just going to click you through some of these images, which I've taken on my travels, to give you an idea of the kind of claims that are made on infrastructure. We expect infrastructure to decarbonize electricity provision, yeah? So to get rid of these lignite mines. We expect them to save energy, yeah, to assist us to save energy. Here is a, a advertising from a, um, a save energy campaign in Singapore in the, in the oil crisis of the 1970s. We expect them also to clean up rivers and lakes from pollution of this kind. This is something in some foam from a chemical plant in Guadalajara, Mexico. We expect the sewage treatment plants to deal with that kind of thing. Yeah? We expect them also to conserve water resources. Here's a photo from Madrid showing the implications of using too much water, it dries out the reservoirs, so we expect water-saving appliances to our infrastructures as well, please. And we also want them to enable the transition to renewables, of course, yeah? Okay, so these systems that have been designed for fossil fuels and very large-scale systems, we expect them to transition now to renewables, whether it's PVs, whether it's wind power, whether it's biomass, or whatever, yeah? Uh, we also want them to open up to prosumers, yeah? so consumers that are also producing electricity, for example. Here's a photograph of a, of a tenant's um, energy cooperative in Berlin who are feeding electricity into the pipe. So we're expecting the infrastructures to welcome that kind of thing nowadays. And we expect them to promote cross-domain synergies, so power to gas, or here we have power generation to electric vehicles. We're expecting them to perform that kind of uh, transition as well, and also to combat climate-induced droughts and floods. You see what I'm getting at? There's lots of things. Closed resource cycles. Here's a picture I took in Jerusalem. You can see the wall just in the back there, which is about using, reusing wastewater as irrigation for plants. Again, so reusing water, reusing nutrients. So there's all sorts of new demands being put on these infrastructures. And of course, we want affordable services for all. So please don't make this too expensive, yeah? All these new demands. <laughs> Keep it cheap, yeah? And finally, of course, we want to serve peripheral locations. So anywhere that happens to be, we, needs to be served with electricity, water, and all the rest. So massive demands original ones and new ones in putting on these systems that we don't really like to see at all. There's a problem there, isn't there? So this is my core question to my presentation today. How can we unlock the transformative capacity of infrastructure? How can we unlock that? And my argument is if this infrastructure is going to perform something for the multiple challenges that I've been talking about, we're going to have to go beyond that myopic vision I said at the beginning get beyond this notion that infrastructures are invisible, get beyond this notion that they're only the domain for experts and we should keep our hands off that, and that, it's, and, and that they are completely obdurate and therefore not interesting when it comes to transitions. We need to surpass that, okay? And I'm going to argue three things in my talk, which kind of cross-cutting points I'm going to make. The first one is we need to look beyond the technical to the social in infrastructure, okay? So these infrastructure systems, we like to see them, and the images I've given are often very physical artifacts. But in actual fact, those physical artifacts are being created, they're being held together by institutional arrangements, regulations, patterns of use, funding schemes, and lots of other issues that are very social, are very political. And that's why we, in social sciences, refer to infrastructures very much as socio-technical systems or socio-technical configurations to emphasize how the social and the technical is always there together, always together. The second point is we need to look beyond infrastructure to urban contexts. 
So not just seeing as infrastructure systems as kind of isolated from the cities or the towns or the regions where they're located, they are very much not only the product of those cities, but also the medium of urban politics, as I hope to argue in the course of my talk. And the third one, we need to look beyond the present to infrastructural pasts. Now, you may think, think that sounds rather odd and a bit counterintuitive. Looking to the past for the future, mm, maybe it's it, because historians say that kind of thing. But I want to show today how this, the past can be really inspirational in perhaps correcting some misapprehensions we have about infrastructure and showing pathways that might be inspiring for the future. So that's the purpose of, those are the three sort of main images I'm going to do. I'm going to look first of all now at some of the literature about infrastructure to explore how these issues are being addressed in some of the literatures, but I'll do that light. Before then, I go on to the Berlin case and look at some of those examples we're talking about. Okay, so let's have a look at the, the histories of infrastructure in the literature. And there are a couple of big prominent themes that are very, very well known in literature. One is a, a literature that's been going on from the 1980s on large technical systems. So these are historians of technology who've been very interested in explaining reasons for the emergence and the stabilization and development of large technical systems for water, energy, and so on. They have a very systemic perspective, so they're very interested in the way that technologies work with institutions and actors. And they've developed this notion of path dependence. So this idea that the small beginning, decisions made right at the, at the start of these systems create self-reinforcing um, mechanisms which make it very difficult to change a path from one path to another, which is why, for example, we were having difficulties with our energy transitions shifting away from very large utilities that are often structured around national and international networks. Now, it's been criticized, this literature, um, for disregarding some of the dynamics in these large technical systems, for neglecting some of the agency beyond the system builders, they're very oriented around the system builders, and very much on centralized systems and so on. So there's, it's, it's been very formative, but there have also been some interesting criticisms about that kind of literature. Another one which is perhaps very familiar in the Netherlands in particular is transitions theory. So while large technical systems theory has been very interested in explaining the intransigence or durability of these systems, transitions, as the name implies, is much more interested in how these systems change at all and how they can change, how they do change, okay? There have been a lot of sort of historical case studies being done on explaining the kind of mechanisms involved, the trajectories of technologies um, across a certain areas. And they've developed this notion of the multi-level perspective that some of you may be familiar with, trying to explain change in terms of the relationship to niches, small areas where change happens, um, the, the socio-technical regimes organizing it, and more sort of landscape general contextual factors. This literature has also come in for some criticism, though, that it sort of ignores issues of power and contestation, that it's nevertheless quite biased towards technology. It doesn't really consider social actors. People have also argued it doesn't really consider the user or the consumer perspective to infrastructures as well, okay? Um, I found both of these interesting, but I've got this, put it, where concepts meet empirics. I've been using both of these and other literatures as well in my book that I've written. But in actual fact, what I found by writing this 100-year history of Berlin's history, of Berlin's infrastructures, I've discovered the limitations of both these approaches. Now, on the one hand, I mean, the, there is a lot of path dependency out there in Berlin's infrastructure history. You can find that if you want to look for it. Just as there are a lot of transitions, surprise, surprise, in Berlin's infrastructure history. If you look, you know, if you look for them, you'll find them. However, neither of those two approaches are adequate of explaining that 100-year history altogether. And that kind of got me thinking about the need to reconsider how we conceptualize continuity and change and those interactions. And I'm just going to give these pointers here of where, I, where my empirical work on Berlin is revealing a different kind of, a messier kind of infrastructure history. Whereas I say here, the com there's a combination of continuity and change at the same time. Yeah? There's not just one period where it's all continuity and another period where it's all change. They're having it at the same time. So you've got the layering of the old and the new is always there. You've got non-linear trajectories. So I've discovered lots of transitions that were actually reversed later on, or technologies that came and then went. So this notion of some kind of linear trajectory going off into the future doesn't really add up to the kind of empirics that I've been looking at. 
I've discovered discarded alternatives that were out there that don't really you know, go below the radar station. But also I've discovered the huge significance of urban context to infrastructure. And that brings me to the second branch of literature, which is very much about infrastructures in the city that's formed this time not by innovation scholars and by historians of technology, but much more by urban studies scholars, um, um, people working at the inter interplay between STS and human geography. And <laughs> there's a book that was written um, 2001 by Steve Graham, Simon Marvin, called Splintering Urbanism, that some of you may know, which is a real seminal work in this field. And in that book, they called infrastructure the Cinderella of urban studies. Well, now, after 20 years, I can really say Cinderella has come of age in a big way. Yeah, she's a princess now because this issue of infrastructure has really taken off. And there's a whole raft of social studies who will, that are looking at infrastructure as a lens on the urban condition, yeah? There's a lovely quote here from um, um, Asha Amin, who says, we are seeing the rise of a new genre of thinking that narrates the social life of a city through its material infrastructure. The social, not the technical life of a city, the social life of a city through its material infrastructure. So using the so, uh, looking at a city as a socio-technical arrangement is a new way that's very, become very, very powerful in social sciences in the last um, sort of 15 to 20 years. I'm just going to click through some of the themes that are very, very popular in this kind of literature at the moment, just to give you an idea of the kind of issues that are moving people um, in these literatures. There's one, obviously, about underground urbanism, and this is not just about the kind of the underbelly of the city you see in this image, but about the hidden politics, the hidden institutions that you don't really see to infrastructures. There's a lot of research about the relationship between state building and infrastructure. So how infrastructure systems, big infrastructure projects like dams, have been um, enrolled in state building processes in the past as well as today, yeah? Um, you, what you see here is a mural on the Yellow River in China where you see a sort of heroic construction of a hydroelectric power plant, which is to symbolize the progress and the sort of linear progress trajectories of Mao's China a very typical instance of in infrastructure being used to support a political regime. Another one, the politics of infrastructure is a very popular issue in the literature at the moment. So they're trying to show how this issue of infrastructure that we may think is very apolitical or even unpolitical because it's so technical, is actually highly contested, always very, very political. This is a photograph of a protest again in Mexico, in Guadalajara, against the building of a dam which is called the Dam of Death. And they're calling it the Dam of Death because they say this dam is going to create lots of new contamination and it's going to be hugely expensive, which is going to be very damaging. So I think we like to think of dams as being, you know, um, sort of medium of progress is actually often the case, uh, objects of a lot of criticism. Splintering Urbanism is the book that I referred to by Steve Graham and Simon Marving. And their theory basically has been, and it's, it's been a, a very contested theory, is basically the infrastructures that we always like to think of as actually removing spatial inequalities, removing inequalities by having universal service, are in many places actually exacerbating, accelerating spatial disparities. As some cities, some neighborhoods have lots of innovative technologies, can afford that, and other ones are being left behind, as being shown rather dramatically with these two different pictures here. And that's become a, a, a point of great contention in the literatures, how far infrastructure really is a unifying force today. So other literatures are looking at the securitization of infrastructure. In other words, you may have heard the term of critical infrastructure, the vulnerabilities of infrastructure, whether it's to terrorist attacks, to uh, climate change impacts, or, or um, hacking offenses, or whatever. Um, here is a rather dramatic in, uh, instance uh, of what, saying what would happen to you if you encroached on the beyond the barrier of this water reservoir in Singapore, um, apparently you'd get shot. So, but there's a lot of literature looking at that and problematizing the securitization of infrastructure, saying it's trying to push it beyond public scrutiny by trying to draw a line around it and saying this is, this is something that, again, something for the experts only. There's literature also on the multiscalar politics of infrastructure. <laughs> this is a nice picture I took in, in Oslo, uh, in Norway, and it's, 
It's a poster by an environmental NGO calling for Sellafield in the UK to be closed down, yeah? Illustrating the sort of international nature of infrastructure. It's not just about your own city. It's not just about your own country. We're talking about how infrastructure decisions are part of international agreements. And as you will see with the Berlin case, very much to do with geopolitics. So we have in, in, literature is also about infrastructures and urban greening. Um, here you see a picture of Singapore with those, the, the way the infrastructures are used for water, water infrastructures and energy infrastructures to have, have uh, green buildings all together. But if you just turn around the next street, I took that second picture on the right, just turn around the, the corner, you see a very different image of streets just full of air conditioning appliances as far as the eye can see. So a wonderful illustration of the kind of greenwashing of green buildings. Literature's looking at those kind of problems of infrastructure as well. Gentrifying infrastructure, the way that some of these old infrastructures are becoming buildings that are being revamped and becoming hubs of new gentrified ways of living. If you think of the kind of places, where I come from, in Berlin, Lots of the bars, lots of the um, uh, sort of techno sites, lots of event locations, a former power stations, transformer stations, or in this case, this is in Berlin, it was a former sewage treatment pl uh, plant that was a, a pumping station that is now a restaurant. But there are other buildings, other s infrastructures that are surplus to requirements that are being pulled down. So there's an interesting literature about sort of cold spots in infra infrastructure and how they are being removed to make, to make way for other places. This is an old power station in Berlin that was being dismantled in 2007. So you get the idea of there's lots of work being done by social scientists on lots of different issues. And you see how, how political some of these things are and how the social and the, and the technical are very much part of that. So. That's my way of introduction, as it were. Let's come to the nitty-gritty of Berlin. And um, I'm going to give you some insight into Berlin's infrastructure histories because I want to I want to kind of dispel this notion of these linear trajectories and also give you a real flavor of the sort of political geography um, of, of infrastructure because I, I think it's so well illustrated in the Berlin case. I'm going to do it with uh, three thematic lenses, and I've chosen them quite deliberately because they kind of... They're visible across those 100 years, from 1920 to 2020. And one of them is the urban utility of utilities. So that's like a play on words and the word utility. So it's looking at the political work being done by utility companies for energy, um, water, sewage, and so on. And I'm looking at that deliberately across different political regimes. So across the Weimar Republic, across the Nazi era, um, across the political division with East and West Berlin, up to reunification as well. The second one, infrastructured urban regional metabolisms. I'm kind of interested in how looking beyond Berlin, beyond the borders of Berlin. It's about the flows of energy and water into the surrounding region and how the surrounding region gets kind of enrolled into Berlin's own infrastructure, something that's often not seen in a lot of the work done, which is often very much sort of fetishizes the city and glorifies the city. It doesn't really think beyond that. And the third one is, is a kind of response to a lot of the criticism that we focus very much on the infrastructure providers and not so much on the consumers and the, cons and the consumption side of things. So I've called this from the compliant to the unruly consumer because at the beginning of the story, it's very much about passive consumers who are being asked to do certain things in certain ways. And by the end of the story, as you see, they've got completely out of control and they want to do things themselves, challenging this notion um, as, as infrastructure as being a realm for the experts and a, with a sort of no entry sign on the front of the door. Okay, so I'm going to look at each of these in, um, um, in detail. The urban utility of utilities. So let's go back to the 1920s. Now, why 1920? It's because it was, uh, that's when Greater Berlin was, was formed in 1920. It was, it, it was a very big event because Berlin grew 12 times in size. 12 times in size. It became the second largest city in the world after Los Angeles, third largest in terms of population, okay? After New York and London. And I'm mentioning that because it came with a huge political ambition to unite the city and create universal living standards in the whole city. And the city fathers, and there were a few mothers, but it was mainly fathers, were very interested in using infrastructure systems as deliberate political tools of this kind of universalization program that they had in mind. So it was all about creating uniform tariffs across the whole city. 
So the richer areas did not have the cheaper tariffs and the poorer areas the higher tariffs as had been in the past. Universal standards, technical standards, uh, universal um, services across the whole city, very important. And this was only made possible by building some pretty large pioneering power stations like the one on the left there or um, um, experimental sewage treatment plants like what you see on the right. When the Nazis came to power, the utility to which these utilities were put was very different. It wasn't the Berliners that were important then. It wasn't a municipal campaign to improve life of Berliners. It was about the Deutsche Volk. It was about the German Volk as defined by the Nazis. Okay? And all of a sudden, you see these infrastructure services being enrolled in the National Socialist campaign. So rather than about providing services and all the rest, it was very much about repression and racism, so excluding people of Jewish background and also political opponents out of the leadership of these utilities. It was about the glorification of the Führer and the Third Reich. So you see um, an image here of the... It was from the, the, the works... Um, magazine of Beerwag, which was the Berlin municipal power utility that was very proud about the kind of way it was lightening up this main axis, the east-west axis in Berlin, um, uh, which was used by Albert Speer for his Germania plans. So the, the way that were used in sort of symbolic acts of supporting national socialism was, became very, very vis visible and with militarization as the, pro uh, the plans for war um, in, uh, came um, developed. I'll come back to the resource art Oktaki issue because that's very interesting. In the 1950s, Berlin's infrastructure systems became part of the Cold War game. You had the division of East and West Berlin in 1948-49, so long before the building of the wall in 1961, okay? And that's when those utility systems were divided between East and West. And so you had a competition, a political competition, which side can do best. So West Berlin were showcasing the consumerism to show the superiority of a capitalist society by building lots of power stations. That's the way they did it, wasn't it? That's how they'd done it in the 20s, so they do it again. So this graph shows, this is a very technical graph, but it shows you that wonderful linear curve of um, consumption, expected consumption growth, being covered with those little blocks, which is showing the new power stations that are going to be built. So you always build a power station one ahead of the other to keep ahead of the curve. Keep ahead of the curve, yeah? We're going to keep it, yeah? By just expanding, building and expanding, yeah? At the same time, on the other side of the political divide, okay, you had East Germany showcasing socialism, the socialist city. So they say, well, for us, it's important that electricity is cheap. Yeah, so we have much cheaper electricity, and they actually had more electricity than in West Berlin in the early 1950s. So I love that um, this is a poster saying more, mehr Strom für den Aufbau des Sozialismus, more electricity for constructing socialism. It's not only a claim we need more, but it's actually we have more electricity, as they had in the early 50s. The, the, the tables turned later on, but that time it was a kind of, yep, that's socialism, one for us, yeah, over capitalism. Um, what we saw, but we see between the 50s and 80s again, you see on both sides of the city, the infrastructures get reconfigured around the divided city. Yeah, they had been united, and now they get reconfigured by their own one. So this is a wonderful um, diagram of what electricity supply in West Berlin looked like. Can you see the way they're sort of cut off? The electricity powers are cut off all the way around West Berlin. West Berlin was effectively an island, electricity-wise, yeah? And the experience of the blockade in 1948-49, where they had been actually cut off, then the West Berlin authorities insisted on being absolutely autark in electricity production and gas production, town gas production. Okay, so they produced both of those 100% by the end of the 1950s. Just imagine that, what that requires. All those power stations within West Berlin. At the same time, in East Berlin, with the water networks, any, any, any flows that were going across the border there are having to pay hard currency for. So the East, East Berlin authorities were very interested in reconfiguring their own networks around their own new political geography. So what you see here, is the, the red lines on that map are the new water mains that were built. The black ones were the old ones that had been there before 1948-49. The red lines are the ones that have been built afterwards. And what you can see, they're moving it out to the, to the edge of Berlin and away from the border with West Berlin. So really interesting ways in which the political systems are, w are manifesting themselves in the materiality of these infrastructures. So West Berlin was very much about maximizing security through autarky. 
Yeah, you, 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 get all, you get separate from the rest of the country, you protect yourself that way. So they stored a lot of coal reserves, they urbanized the flows, so cutting down the waste sewage that went out to the neighboring area. Also exploiting synergies, it's really interesting there. There was a real boost in district heating. Why was the boost in district heating? Because West Berlin had all these power stations in West Berlin. So if you've got all these power stations in West Berlin, you do cogeneration, yeah? Cogenerate co heat and power together. So all of a sudden, there was a need to build a district heating. So West Berlin's district heating net is a direct product of the Cold War and the desire to be autark with its own electricity provision. A wonderful example of that combination of politics and technology. Um, in East Berlin, it was very much about striving from a socialist infrastructural ideal that was getting ever more distant because they just didn't have the money. The money was short. And by the 1960s, they were running into huge difficulties trying to keep their infrastructure systems going. Lots of complaints to local people about lack of water pressure and lack of electricity and all the rest. And the way the socialist system is, how do you respond to that lack of money? You produce a plan. Yeah, that was what socialism is about. You have a plan, yeah, like a five-year plan or whatever. So these amazing, I really do think they're amazing, amazing urban planners and infrastructure planners say, right, we've got to, it's like the leap, big leap forward. We've got to produce a plan and call it a socialist plan. It's going to be an infrastructure plan. There's going to be nothing ever like it. And I've never read anything like this plan before because it's an amazing way of trying to integrate all the infrastructures they had there into urban planning and make urban planning depend on the infrastructure first because they didn't have much of it, yeah? So they did this plan for everything. There was district heating. They had air conditioning, even there in the 1970s, that electricity uh, and water and all the rest. And the big, and the big uh, sort of flagship project within this was this, what you can see here, the building site. It's a big walk-in combined infrastructure channel that West Berlin did not have, OK? Did not have. You can walk it, and there you've got all the infrastructure things on left and right as you go in there. It still exists today. It's the most wonderful thing. However, they didn't have money to do much of it, so there's only about 10 kilometers built altogether, and the whole plan ran into all sorts of difficulties there. But it's a wonderful illustration of an attempt to try and do what socialism does best, which is produce a plan, and try and overcome and show that they can do what, what capitalism can't do, because they're forever, you know, they're, each utility has its own system, and here you can do it together because you're integrating because it's a socialist state. Really wonderful example of that. Okay, um, the second point here, infra this will be shorter now, infrastructure, urban, regional metabolisms. I think it's really interesting to see, we've been focusing very much on Berlin now, the city, you know, glorifying the city. <coughs> But the cost of what Berlin was doing was massive for the surrounding region, yeah? So the region surrounding Berlin was regarded very much as a source and a sink, yeah? A source of resources, yeah, for water and electricity and, you know, coal and all the rest, and as a sink for all the waste products, you know, solid waste, sewage and all the rest. And there was amazing sort of plans in the 1920s about the expansion of Berlin and what it was going to need. There was a plan that was produced by the Urban Planning Department in 1925, I think it was, and they predicted by 1954, Berlin was going to have 7.4 million inhabitants. Do you know how many we have at the moment? 3.5? Not even half that. Yeah? However, that, that figure was taken as fact and was used to plan the most amazing, expansive um, electricity and, above all, water capacity expansions that was going to require massive imports of... Have we got that? Yeah. Massive imports of water, water transfers from the Oder River, from, the, from the, the Elbe River, to support Berlin. It was all about feeding Berlin. So really dramatic um, interventions in the local, in, in the regional metabolism, basically. And this took on a sort of new twist in the Nazi era. The Nazis were very keen, as I mentioned before, on national autarky. That was all part of the four-year Goering's um, four-year plan. In other words, to make Germany fit for war by making it less dependent on imports from outside of fuels and nutrients and all the rest. And this idea of using, reusing wastewater and using the wet nutrients from wastewater became embroiled in a kind of techno-politics in which some engineers who were keen in, in sort of what we would now call recycling technologies found themselves all of a sudden arguing in favor of a very nationalist um, and radical national socialist program 
for creating out of the sewage treatment plants sort of colonial hubs where people would grow their own vegetables, use the water, but it would also be a place for concentrating the destitute and the social control of the unemployed from Berlin. And these plans that were developed by a landscape architect were originally for 200,000 people, but the idea was to expand that to a one million people who were going to be put in new settlements around a large number of sewage treatment plants that would be prov providing food for the great metropolis of Berlin, or Germany, it was, it was going to be called. So it shows how these ideas of recycling technologies can take off in the most weird and perverse ways in the political hands of people who see an interest for it in that way. Um, however, there were also alternative energies that were being discussed at that time. I've done a bit of work, I've written a paper about this. Um, alternative energies, for example, sewage gas. So gas that was derived from sewage treatment plants that was used to power vehicles, as an example. Or petrol or oils that were being cleaned, collected and cleaned there. What I found was really interesting is that these technologies were not developed by, were not originated by the Nazis. They are actually developed in the 1920s. They were actually operative in the 1920s. But in the hands of the Nazis, they became part of this national autarkic ideal and they were promoted um, often at the expense of the, of, of the interests of some of the, of the inhabitants. What I found for that reason, because it was kind of tarred with a brown brush of Nazism, these technologies after the war were dropped like hot potatoes. They were dropped like hot potatoes, yeah? Although they're the kind of things that we're talking now. The photograph you see on the right is an advert for a biogas plant that was opened just a few years ago. And I kind of looked into their details of describing that. Did they refer to the history? in their own city about biogas and, and sewage gas? Of course they didn't. Nobody knows that, that history. It's not just forgotten, it was discarded, it was deliberately discarded because of those political associations with national socialism. So I think that's something we really need to tackle, that political dimension to that. Um, developing any energy storage technologies, the more you get into this, the more you see the wackiest con uh, connections to what's going on now. You know, now we're all talking about batteries, the need for battery, how do we store energy? This is not new. It really isn't new. This is an amazing, this is steam, this is a, called a Hutspeicheranlage. It's like it stores steam as a backup for power cuts and to balance out peak loads. And basically, you store steam in there, and when you have peak loads, you can use that to power the turbines. You can fire it up in 30 seconds. 30 seconds, that's really fast. It was created in 1928. It was an absolute sensation at the World Electricity Conference in 1930. It was the largest of its kind in the world. And it worked without a problem until just a few years ago. They took it out of operation just a few years ago, you know. A rather less successful one, but nevertheless quite dramatic, Berlin, again a pioneer, was this battery storage facility in the 1980s. It looks like a building is a building. It's a massive building, three stories, full of lead batteries. And it was created in the mid-1980s. Why was it created? It was created in West Berlin to create an even faster response for covering peak loads or any kind of um, turbine falling out. It could respond in 10 seconds. So within 10 seconds of a, of a power outage, you could get that thing fired up. That would go on for about 15 minutes, and then that, uh, that, that steam system would kick in, and then you could get your gas turbines going. So there's a kind of cascade system to, to get that security of, en of energy provision in West Berlin going. It was created in the 80s. Of course, in the, by the 90s, it was completely redundant. So it's one of those surplus infrastructures that was produced out of the geopolitics of the Cold War era. Um, and the final one I want to look at is from the compliant to the unruly consumer. Again, I want to challenge this notion that what we're doing today is incredibly new. I mean, if you, you, think, if you hear the term demand management in terms of energy, you'd think, well, this is, this is pretty new. Or maybe in the 70s, 80s, they were toying around with this kind of thing. That is rubbish. You know, there was demand management was very highly developed in the 1920s. 1920s, yeah? And I'm going to show you how. Um, the the, the Beerwag uh, was the electricity utility, the municipal one in Berlin, and Gazag was the gas utility. They, they did a really interesting survey of household use. They did a survey in 1920, uh, 1928, a very detailed one to see who was using what in households in terms of you know, irons and washing machines and all the rest. Oh, this was the early, early electrification. And they were kind of using that. You see this amazing showroom that they had for selling electricity, electrical appliances there. But the point I really want to emphasise is this higher purchase scheme called Electrissima, which really shows how a scheme like that can, 
can travel through different political regimes and different socioeconomic circumstances. It was basically a higher purchase scheme. So it was a way of, basically, you bought, you went in, if you wanted to buy, I don't know, a washing machine, electric washing machine, you went in, you bought it, but you didn't pay the money, but you paid it in installments with your electricity bill, basically. And the person who paid the money was the beer bag. It was the utility that did that. So it was interested in boosting sales. What was interesting, when this system was started off in the mid-20s, it was many to just to boost electricity consumption. They just wanted to boost electricity consumption. With a few years, they realized, my God, we've got problems with peak capacity and all the rest. We've got a real problem here. Peak loads in the evenings and you know, not being used at all at night. So by the 19, late 1920s, they were already reconfiguring this electricity system so that they were boosting the sale of night storage heaters and night water heaters. And even, you won't believe this really, but charging batteries for electric vehicles in the late 1920s, okay? By the Depression, it was being rejigged again because the utilities realized that while in the Depression, the electricity consumption of big business was absolutely collapsing, for the households, it was staying relatively constant. So the households all of a sudden became important players in sustaining electricity, um, sustaining electricity demand within a system to try and offset the losses in industry. When the Nazis came to power, they continued that in the same vein, and then were using electricity again to promote the sale of fridges just before the war. Why were they promoting the sale of fridges? Well, that was all to support the war effort, because fridges kept food fresh. Yeah? In the 1950s, it was re reinvigorated in West Berlin to showcase consumerism again, electricity. Yeah? So different political regimes used exactly the same tool in a slightly jigged it in a different way to their own political interests. Okay, so while these utilities were very keen on pushing consumption upwards, they were very confident they could do that. I think it's quite interesting how, what efforts were they making to reduce consumption? Because that's the kind of thing we're look, looking at now. Yeah, we're interested now. How effective were they in doing that? Well, they themselves were always very skeptical about doing this. They wanted to avoid rationing at all. So you see some interesting um, attempts to persuade people not to use too much electricity. Here is um, uh, an advert um, during the uh, Second World War, which says, uh, close, uh, no, shut down the, the, uh, the, the electric heater. The electricity which you are saving will work for victory. So it's making no bones about the fact, if you've read the small print there, that this was to so that it save electricity for the armaments industry. It was very, very clear about that. Also quite interesting, the sort of gender roles that you see here, yeah? It, it's the woman who's being irresponsible, who's, who, who's putting the heater on, because she needs to be hot, you know? And it's, of course, the responsible husband who's saying, no, 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 you, you've forgotten, you know, we need, we need this electricity for the war effort and all that. Um, but also getting people to use electricity to meet planning targets. I mentioned in East Berlin, um, very quickly, they, they didn't have the capacity to produce enough electricity. So all of a sudden, it was lovely. It was like mehr Strom schön, aber denk an den Plan. You know, it's nice to have lots of electricity, but do think about the plan. And meet out of that sentence, denk an den Plan. <laughs> oh, the plan. You know, you got to meet the plan. Um, and, and that's a wonderful example here of trying to do that. I found lots of records in the archives that it was pretty useless. It didn't work at all. They had these uh, the energy commissars. There's lots of the energy commissars who would go out into the offices and go out into the factories and have a look around and see how people are wasting electricity and all the rest. And apparently, there's such a good early warning system in the offices that everybody just hid their, their electric heaters and stuff. And so, so these poor commissars are writing reports back so you couldn't find anything. Obviously, you know, early warning systems working really well here. So what I'm trying to say is that you know, attempts to try and stop people using, forcing people to use less electricity, less gas, and so on, were actually pretty ineffective. And I think that has been really, really formative in the heads of energy planners in the city and the utilities who think... Asking people not to use so much electricity is a dead end. We've tried that. It doesn't work. We've tried it. Yeah? It doesn't work. I think that's, re that's a really important legacy. If you talk about path dependencies, that's an important one, I think. Not the physical bits. Yeah, that. Standing on the... So, basically, also interesting in the 1970s, the consumers are not only not performing to these requests to use electricity. Some of them, by the 1970s in West Berlin, were actually disputing the whole logic of producing lots of electricity and lots of gas and using that at, at, at all. So they're becoming really unruly 
and not as compliant as they should be. And this became very visible in a very contested plan to build a massive power station of 1,200 megawatts in West Berlin. It already had 12 power stations in West Berlin, and they wanted to build another 12, and this was going to be one of the first big ones. For this power station alone, the number of trees that were going to be felled vary between 30,000 and 60,000. Now, I've lived in West Berlin when it was divided, and I really valued the green forests in West Berlin because there was a wall around it. You couldn't get out. Not that easy, anyway. So the idea of cutting down 60,000 trees gets everybody out. Everybody out, yeah? And then people started criticizing the whole assumption about the need for a power station. They started coming up with alternatives, yeah? Which is about using electricity or perhaps going to reaching an agreement with East Germany on producing cleaner electricity in East Germany and so on. So this whole idea of we need to build and supply, build and supply, build and supply, in more power stations was being undermined by West Berliners who might have accepted that logic in the 1950s, but no longer in the 1970s. So you really have the consumer, or some consumers at least, challenging the very logics of build and supply that had been so powerfully presented in West Berlin at that time. And basically, the protesters, the social movements we know today in Berlin are standing on the shoulders of those protesters in the 1970s in West Berlin, the 1980s in East Berlin as well. You may be familiar with what's going on in Berlin at the moment. There's been very interesting movements around um, a t a campaigns to remunicipalize the water utilities, uh, the electricity grids and the gas grids and so on. It's been successful with the water utility. And basically, they're campaigning against this notion of the utilities being the experts. They're no longer accepting that myopic view, you know, that the civil engineers know best and the ones that have always done it know best. They're setting up their own organizations, whether it's cooperatives or energy roundtable. They've, pr they've pr um, persuaded the city government in Berlin now to create its own utility, own new utility, having privatized its own one many years ago, called Berliner Stadtwerke, which is now producing green energy and all this. But what's really interesting about it, it's not just about municipalization in the sense that it needs to go back into municipal hands and that's the end of the story. It's about making these organizations more democratically accountable, more socially responsible, and of course, more environmentally sustainable at the same time. So, I'm gonna conclude now with some remarks on what do I mean by remaking the city through infrastructure? That was the title of my, well, this is the title of my talk. What do I mean by that, reflecting what I've just said? The first point, I think, is Berlin has been continuously remade with the help of infrastructures, okay? Throughout its whole city, uh, uh, history, and I hope I've shown you that. And to put it in the point, it, the infrastructures are not just in the city of Berlin, in the sense of being located there. They're not just for the city of Berlin, in the sense of having a function, of providing a service. They're very much of the city. They're part and part of it. They're product and medium of the city itself. That's what I mean about remaking Berlin. The second point is that Berlin's infrastructures reflect a complex relationship between continuity and change. You'll have seen there there were, lots, there were continuities in there across those periods, across those regimes, but there were lots of changes as well. And some of them were coexistent. And I think that's really interesting because it unpacks this notion of, of an infrastructure being just about path dependence or just about transitions. You can see those if you look for them, but the whole story takes a much broader, messier, more interesting, a nuanced picture. And the nuances give opportunities that you may not see if you're just focusing on transitions that you're just focusing on path dependence. Third point, the responsiveness of Berlin's infrastructure to political shifts belies their apparent obduracy. You remember that picture of those three water main things that suggested the kind of obduracy I showed right at the beginning of my talk? Well, the examples I hope I've shown in my talk today belie that. They show that there is a lot of movement, there is a lot of dynamics in there that we often don't see if we just focus on the physical bit. So by looking at the socio-technical and not just the technical, it opens up possibilities for dynamism and change that you may not otherwise see. And then finally, I think Berlin's rich infrastructure history can be inspirational for contemporary transitions. And I, we can maybe talk about them in the, in, the, in the discussion afterwards. I'm very interested in this concept of the usable past. So past that you can use for the present and the future. 
So how can it do that? It can question presentist framings. By that I mean framings that are very much defined, determined by the way we see the world at the moment. Yeah? It can question that, put it in historical context. It can demonstrate legacies from the past. I talked about that legacy in the minds of people, thinking that we can't get people to use less electricity. We've done it, it doesn't work. Yeah? Or the legacies of fossil fuel powering Berlin systems. That legacy is very, very powerful, very difficult to get rid of. Um, it can also rectify misrepresentations. That notion that we haven't had these alternative energies in the past, there's something completely new. Or we haven't had demand management in the past, something relatively new. You can point to history and say, no, folks, there has been that in the past. You may not want to see it, but it'd be really in, um, um, insightful if you do look at that in more detail. You can draw analogies between the past and present, so look at certain times when, I don't know, when, when you're trying to reduce water consumption at a certain time, what were the experiences made then? What were the assumptions underpinning those plans? And how did it play out? That's the great advantage of historical research. You can show actually how it played out in real life afterwards. And it can reveal alternatives alternative pathways that were being revealed in the past as well. The alternatives are not just there now. There are lots of alternatives that are sort of simmering there in the past that haven't been revealed. And it can also broaden our horizons, but just seeing that, that the way that we see things today has to be seen in a broader historical context. And I'm sort of toying with those ideas of how we can use history in that way. And basically, that was my message, and I'm going to finish with some unashamed advertising the advert section right at the end, right in the middle. If you're, if you're still keen on infrastructure, having listened to me talking for all this time, and you want to learn a bit more about what's going on in Berlin, perhaps you want to see some of those sites I was talking about. Um, I've produced some short films, or so I've, with, together with some, uh, the, my funding organization, the Gerda Enkel Stiftung, thank you for that. I produced six short films about the history of Berlin's infrastructures, which takes me into some of these wonderful places uh, that I've been talking about now. And you can download those for free. Uh, if you just look up Invisible Berlin and my name, you'll, you can have a look at that. And there's also an interview with me at the end talking about why I think this kind of thing is interesting. Um, but I'm really, really keen um, to get your questions and your comments on what I've been saying now. And thank you very, very much indeed for coming and for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Timothy.